right, we're doing it live here. What's going on, everyone? Welcome to another episode of the Patio Slate Podcast. I am one of three hosts. My name is Anthony. I'm here with Tony and Nate. And before I ask how you guys are doing, I'm going to ask, what have you guys been up to? It's been a few days since we've chatted, and a lot can happen. So what, what the hell is going on, guys? Uh, let's see, adulting, trying to see shows and not being able to make it because I'm adulting. That always sucks, but it is what it is. Oh, so a normal week. Okay. A normal week. Yeah. I mean, it's still trying to geek out. It's like that calendar reminder is true. It's, it's sometimes it's a letdown. It's, it's FOMO to the, to the max, you know? Working shows and leaving early because you don't have to be at work anymore, but you're too yeah. tired and old. <laughs> exactly. Man, I feel elderly. <laughs> that is, that's a true sign of getting old, is being mm-hmm. out of show and leaving early. I've done it. We've all done it. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah, I've done it a couple times in the past year. Not, a, not because I want to, just like, oh, I got a 45-minute drive home, and I got to work in the morning. I'm like, I just got to go. Like, I'm exhausted. It's time to get out of here. We've turned into our parents. Nothing good happens after midnight. Never forget that. <laughs> uh, and, and nothing made me feel older than talking to the guys that we talked to tonight. I was like, shit, we're 15 years older than these guys. <laughs> Holy shit, or, you know, 12 years older than these guys. Yeah, man, we did. We, ta- we chatted with uh, Harold and Joey from Long Island's very own Koyo. It's a band that we've had uh, on our radar for a bit. First got introduced to them back in 2021, Drives Out East CP, and just have followed them since. And, you know, they're on Pure Noise now. A lot of hype with these guys. And uh, we're definitely here for it. So we, we chatted. What did we chat about? We chatted. Jeez. Oh, boy. Long, Long Island. Island. Yeah, we chatted. Them coming together, how it started as kind of a no-frills project. Like, oh, if we're all home and we feel like playing a show, we will. You know, that kind of stuff. And then to the point where they're now, you know, we're, we're awaiting a, an LP from them here in 2023. And they were most anticipated for Utswan going into this year. And, you know, we, we were like, oh, we should reach out to those guys. I bet they'd, they'd come on and talk with us about that. And sure enough, they did. And they were awesome. So fun to talk to. And you can hear the excitement in their voices and what they do, which with us... There's no excitement in what we, <laughs> we should do. We're just old not at the same whatever. level. Not at the same <laughs> level. But it was awesome. Those dudes are awesome dudes. And with that, us being oldies and these guys being youngsters, they're going to school us on what it's like to be a band these days. So we're going to get into it right now with Koyo. What's up, guys? Tony here. If this is your first time checking us out, go back and check out some of our other conversations. We've had Vinny Caruana of The Movie Life and I Am The Avalanche. We've had Brian McTernan earlier this year to talk 20 years of Thrice's artist in The Ambulance. He was the producer of that record. He's also in Be Well and Battery. Go check that one out. Or Casey Cavalier from The Wonder Years. They're about ready to hit the road here, and we're going to check them out when they come through our neck of the woods. But yeah, great conversations with those folks and Sergio Vega of Quicksand, the legendary Quicksand. And many others back there. So go check that stuff out, PatioSlave.com. All that stuff lives there at PatioSlave on any of the social media platforms. All right, we're here. Joey and Harold from Long Island's very own Koyo. Guys, how you doing? Chilling. Pretty good. Pretty good. I am. And actually, I do want to thank Joey's mustache for coming out tonight because that's. Yeah. I wasn't sure if we were going to get it. And actually, uh, Harold, you get one too, right? And mine's just blonde. It likes to hide. <laughs> <laughs> but but Joey's is uh yeah Joey's is sometimes there, sometimes not. I personally love when it's there. Also, I think it looks great. We, we've been pretty consistent with it for a while. I feel it all really started on the first tour we did last september we all agreed we'd just grow out mustaches because at that point i think i had like a beard and a mustache so i just shaved the beard and everyone in the band grew them out and i've pretty much for the most part have just been letting it rock since there's there's been some occasions where i've fucked up shaving and you know it, it has to go too but it comes back fast i hear that i almost shaved mine today like into a mustache my beard just for this oh i should respect awesome. that i really respect yeah. that we wow. should we no. should have done that twice. i don't know why we didn't yeah <laughs> the handlebars would have thrown me off and i would have run with it yeah it, it messes up the Kid, whole kids flow. wouldn't like that so we uh every year we do like a predictions 
anticipation episode for the coming year. A couple weeks ago, we dropped that episode. One of the big predictions that I made was 2023 is the year of Long Island, New York, baby. Respectable prediction. Yeah, it's pretty good, right? So you got Koyo LP, Incendiary LP, yes, ru- true. rumored for Q1, Silent Majority back in some capacity, a couple shows. Vinny said New Avalanche. Mm-hmm. Pain of Truth is almost a festival headliner. King Nine, crushing. And my favorite band of all time, Crime and Stereo, that album is probably going to come out this year. Yeah, uh, allegedly, on allegedly. Its, on its way. That was a very distinct nod. You, I think you yeah. know something. <laughs> well, yeah, when I, when I, was something. Told, I was told when we played shows with them last, or show with them last year, that it was going to come out in 2022. Of and course. it didn't, but you know. There's, there was a new song for that AMH comp, so I, that's like, I feel like by their standards of releasing music, that was like a big move for them to put anything out at all, so I'm sure a new record uh, this year is plausible if it was supposed to come out last year. So you guys, are, you must be feeling that. Like, Ally's definitely having a moment right now. Uh, you know, I, I think that from our perspectives, and this is not because of like this is this is just like as listeners as fans of of Long Island. I think Joey and I would say that Long Island's been having a year for the past twenty years. You know, that's like true. We're, yeah. Totally, we're yeah. just so like like we're very loyal to it. You know, that's like it's a huge part of who we are, and um, like we have always sort of felt that way about Long Island, where it's like we're we're very concerned with what's happening even if it's like not at the at the world scope yet and i know what you're saying like absolutely all of these bands like are just it kind of feels like we've watched uh, like all of our friends bands like grow into this like insane monster you know in, mm-hmm. in a good way i don't know it's hard to explain but like it's awesome it's the coolest thing in the world you know so like like um zach from uh pain of truth has been my roommate the past two years so he's actually always been just on the other side of this wall. And um, it's kind of been weird to like, like to have Koyo and Pain of Truth in the same house to just be talking about like, you know, what's happening next and what they're and listening to them, especially like where they go from playing, you know, this to, in such a short period of time. It's just it's really cool. It's awesome. It absolutely is. And I mean, we grew up in southern Maine and uh, two of us still still here in Maine and we always kind of gravitated towards that scene way back when I mean, we graduated high school in 2003. So we were listening to Brand New and Taking Back Sunday and uh, twonging into the movie life and getting us into Vinny's projects. And it, we've we've talked to Brennan Garone on this podcast about the music of Long Island. So it's really cool to see it continue to yeah. kind of vibe and flourish like you guys are doing now. So really exciting to to hear what you guys have in store for us coming up soon. But let's start at the beginning. Like you grew up there. You uh, you have this kind of rich music history what what's some of the stuff that you guys are listening to growing up i mean i think literally speaking my introduction to alternative music was via becoming friends with harold in seventh grade um, we we met like within the first week of our first year of seventh grade and uh our school district broke it up a little differently than others like your high school's transcripts started in ninth grade but it would be like kindergarten through sixth for elementary seventh through ninth for middle school and then 10th through 12th for the high school i think it was like a population based thing but anyways seventh grade first week you know we didn't go to the same elementary school we met in middle school and within that first month of being friends harold introduced me to basically all the stuff that he'd been introduced to by his sister particularly i remember like the big the big point of obsession at that time was like taking back sunday and brand new those were like the big like life-changing introductions via Harold, but there, there's a whole further back catalog, I think, from his sister, whether it be Newfound Glory, Movie Life, Thursday. Yeah. She just gave you a bunch of CDs, you know? Yeah, I used to, like, like going back... My sister graduated uh, in 05, I think, so, you know, she's, like, 10 years older than Joey and I, and uh, she grew up going to shows on the island, and um, she would, like, you know, she was always buying the new CD and, like, stuff like that. She was just, she was always, like, involved in, like, that world of, like, alternative, like, pop punk, like, you know, hardcore adjacent emo stuff. And, you know, what better place than Long Island for that? So I had a, I had a great sense of pride in where 
you know, and, and knowing that all of these artists that like my sister was showing me were from Long Island. I thought that was so cool. That was what kind of drove that obsession. But yeah, I remember um, being as young as like, I was probably like seven years, six or seven years old. So like, and I was listening to, you know, just like I wanted to hang out like with my sister and listen to whatever she was listening to. And at that time, it was, you know, early 2000s, like, it was brand new. It was Taking Back Sunday. It was like, I remember stealing the movie life 40 hour train back to Penn. I remember ste- like, I remember stealing like a bunch of like, um, Fall Out Boy, take this to your grave. I remember taking that. So from, good. Like, so fucking Stones, good. Stones, Newfound Glory. Mm-hmm. Like I took like a bunch of CDs like from her, like all the time. Like I was doing that very regularly. And I was, I, I mean, I'm still kind of this way, but I was always like, the guy who wanted to show my friends all of this music, you know, I was like, Oh, you guys got to hear this. You guys got to listen to this. And like Joey and I became friends like that first week of school. And so it also, um, our bass player, Spanos, the three of us met. Well, Joey and Spanos had known each other a very, very long time before that. Yeah. Since like second grade. Yeah. We became and friends. The, the three of us met that like, you know, in 2008. And at that time I was, at that time I was kind of like, full like i had was already fully obsessed with those bands you know i just wanted to share it with my friends yeah and me me and Spanos respectively were like you know at that point the amount of time we've been playing you know we were taking guitar lessons and whatnot like it was like probably two years of like heavy interest in music but it was mostly like rock and like metal stuff like classic rock you know like really wasn't put on to anything uh alternative or underground and a lot of the bands we're talking about at that point in 2008 had already had their moment, you know, take it back. Sunday had already blown and had like the hottest three record streak ever. Same with brand new. Like it's not like we were uh, seeing it all at the, the ground level. We weren't going to right. see take it back Sunday. And when, you know, when they put out to all your friends or something, but you know, it was still, uh, it's interesting to look back now. Cause we're both 26 and, you know, we're talking about when we were 12, it's like a lot of time has passed since that, initial point of obsession and introduction it's it's weird to think that you know our formative years were spent obsessing over bands where they were still you know in there that's still the golden years you know that's still the brand new still an active band at that point i I mean i i remember like my sister coming home with the where you want to be cd and like sitting with her to listen to it you know like i remember like i remember going home from school early not early but like running home from school i was uh, with my sister to watch the uh the quiet things video premiere like yeah, i was playing on like fuse and stuff yeah it I was yeah, yeah, yeah i totally absolutely. remember that I an an deal with, with make damn sure i remember watching that premiere that music video in my living room with my sister and like planning the time for it you know like Ooh. i i didn't get i wasn't going to shows yet because i was so young but those experiences were so so important to me you know and like i still remember them as twan would say we would be friends in high school (laughs) (laughs) we were we were like yeah planning to see the music video premieres and like we're waiting at the record stores at midnight and clearly you're talking about cds you know like binders of cds and going through the liner notes so it's basically the same thing and the older siblings introducing you to music that's pivotal totally 100 percent. is that is that what happened with you guys too it definitely helped it definitely helped I'm the oldest, so I was giving it to my yeah, little you brother. Were yeah, <laughs> I had an older cousin who's like three years older than me. He, you know, got me into Rage Against the Machine, and so yeah, that that, that stuff happened for sure. That's awesome. So, Joey, if you didn't meet Harold, when do you think you would have found music, or like that's how it saw music? And you can blame Harold for sitting here today. It sounds well, like I, I, I honestly, I think I do because it's it's plausible, you know, especially like being where we're from that I would have like came across uh would have came across a variety of bands, variety of sounds. But I think I think there's a difference between um and and, and I, I use this term respectfully. I, I don't mean it in a disparaging way, but I think there's a difference between being a person who becomes like obsessed with like making music at a young age and like trying to get in touch with underground music, what's going on locally, what's going on in your own music scene. Versus being just like a civilian person who just discovers a band like Take It Back Sunday or the movie life or, you know, things that are maybe a little more hyper local, even big around here. Like, like Glassjaw obviously had a moment, was big all over the place, but they were, they've always been particularly big on Long Island. 
you know, I could have discovered Glassjaw at age 16, but I don't think it would have meant anything to my life per se. Or maybe I just would have become like an obsessed fan. But when I think Glassjaw, my obsession with that band ties into their deep roots and Long Island's hardcore scene and all the lore. And I, I think that's like the the difference via discovering the music. What I did th- with Harold is we became obsessed with making music, making bands, trying to find out where we could go to shows and see stuff live locally. Like it, it's it's a way more uh, culty, obsessed lifestyle thing than just being a civilian guy that's like, yeah, you know, I like alternative music. You know, I got into classic rock and then I got into like some alt rock. You know, it's it's just a different thing, as as weird as it is to say. So I'll pro- maybe never. You're picking up instruments and trying to figure out how to play it, right? I mean, that's that's got to be yeah. what the next step for you guys, I would think. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, when we were when we were twelve, we started the first incarnation of what has now become Koyo with Joey, our bass player Smanos, and I, and we were we were literally twelve years old, and we yeah. were terrible, you know. But we, oh, yeah. like the the Koyo <laughs> Instagram when we first made it before we had put any music out. So very, very few people had seen it. Joey posted video of us when we were 12 or 13 covering Make Damn Sure in his living room. Mm-hmm. Like, we that was like the filler time. post. If you happen to stumble upon Ooh, the page before we... Uh, up. We'll dig it up. It's, it's live right now. I put, I oh, put them is, up. Nice. If you scroll all the way to the bottom, they're is there. It? Wow, that's cool. But uh, yeah. I, I've, I've archived them on and off through the time we've been a band, but... We, we like made ourselves known probably like three or so months before we put out our first thing ever. And in that time, I didn't like, uh, I didn't hard plug the social media or anything, but we just made the page. I posted that on there and it's like, if you stumble across it, you stumble across it. That's awesome. We, we, that was how we like learned how to pretty much play stuff and like sing was just by trying to emulate, you know, those bands when we were mm-hmm. really, really young. Um, and now it's hilarious that we're not so young and we're still doing it. Yeah, yeah. not not much has and changed. We're still we're still learning how to play our instruments. You know, <laughs> like, we're still figuring that out. Mm-hmm. That's awesome, Joey. I was a big typecast guy. Like, if I wanted to like get my pump on or go for a run, oh, it yeah. was it was that world. I appreciate. So was that was that your first band? It probably wasn't, right? Um, no. So, so Harold and I did a band when we were in high school. That was like our first real rip of like trying to do a band. It changed, it changed a million times, but we did a band called they all float that like basically started as a metalcore band when we were like 14 and kind of scaled with our tastes. We broke up by the time we were, the band broke up when we were like 18, but it went from like metalcore band to like a little like harder version of like metalcore to kind of like a stab at doing a hardcore band and then we broke up. But that was the last band I did. And then I did a couple of years of just show going and road dogging and whatnot. And then Typecast started. So it was my first band that uh I guess uh fir- first band that was taken seriously in the sense first of like, that, like did it. That, like, yeah, went. yeah, yeah. That maybe that other people took seriously is like a good way to put it. You know, like that is no, a good way to put it. They, they all thought we were just like fucking around. We were like teenagers. It, we were like it, learning how to write songs. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. It was it was real deal like training wheels effort. But it did tour and like play out a little bit. Like we did a, a three week tour in a, a fucking um a Ford Explorer, like when like our freshman year <laughs> in college. Dude, um, we were we, had, we were fresh out of high school for that. We were yeah. literally it was insane. It was so bad. It's crazy because we were under the impression that our uh, our drummer would go to air traffic control school the following uh the following year, which I don't think ever happened. No. But um for that reason, we were just like, yo, because e- at eighteen, like you're independent, you're an adult, but you're still under your parents roof or even just like still potentially care for their perspective and i remember going to my parents being like hey like i know i'm allowed to do this but i want your blessing to do this because i just feel like we need to do this or because we might never get an opportunity to do this again lo and behold fast forward a couple years all i'd be doing was touring endlessly and typecast really was a part of the deal for that because with typecast i was also simultaneously touring with vane so it would be like typecast full us Dylan goes back to college for the semester. Okay, well, Typecast can't tour. I'm going to go do another month with Vane. So it'd just be gone for two months at a time, three months at a time. I, I, I literally remember doing things like going to do a 
TM a full England, UK, Van tour, then flying home, landing in New Jersey, immediately play a typecast show. Like just, it was nonstop for a couple of years. I'm jealous. It was dope, but a very busy time in my life. That That's why we started Koya was, um, I, I missed Joey. I don't. Th- he probably didn't miss me. But uh, you, you were missed. We, it, <laughs> I, it, it made no sense. We weren't playing advanced together. It was, yeah. it was, it was nonsense. It was like we, because but besides us, it was like, like I, I didn't tour anywhere near as much as Joey. But I was in, I'm still in Hangman, and um, we, we were touring a little bit, and Joey was touring with Typecast, and our drummer and guitar player, other guitar player, were in Reign of Salvation and adrenaline and see space cowboy like they were there you know there were a lot of bands in that mix and we were all home for a a period of time and we were just like you know like whenever we're home for the short periods like together like we all hang out like why don't we just start writing music together like why have we not tried that you know like why has it been years since we like tried to start a band together like just write some songs together and it turned into a beatdown band and then yeah. that turned into Koya. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, yeah. That, that's right. That's right. That was the order of operations. Yeah. We were, we were kind of like, <laughs> we were great. working on them simultaneously, but uh, the beatdown band finished first. The beatdown band recorded first, like across the board, got over the finish line first, and then yeah. Koya happened. But the goal was, I, as I've said in the past in many podcast interviews, whatever, but it never hurts to just really hammer the point home that Koya was never supposed to tour. The Oh, wow. Spawned idea for the band was specifically to play locally, and we would compromise on yo if like if someone wants us to play a dope show in Philly, and everyone is free, and we don't have to sacrifice any amount of time or money to do it, let's go play that Philly show. That was the standard in which we started the band. Yeah, so like no, no pressure, but making music. But if, hey, if we can all do it, let's go do it. That makes it, sense. It, it was it was no pressure, and even I would I would say like a further insistence on not doing overdoing like like a preference to not play over play like only play long island if we're all home from tour we'll do it no one wanted to go out of their way for this project initially our our goal was to have like the five or six or you know the collective group of friends of ours like seven or eight people like to to be able to have like four or five different long like bands that were local in long island who could open shows because at the time it felt like we saw the same bands on every show yeah we started a little group chat to try and build all these bands out with like eight or so people that we'd all be like oh it'd be cool if you all played together exactly yeah and like the the we only got two of them off the ground and by the time it was we were ready to like do a third it was we were you know koyo had like started like Sequoia got just like a little busy, you know, like yeah. he said he had stuff to do. So we just didn't have the time anymore. But we just wanted to open shows. Yeah, yeah. The, the genuine, like, I, I think the, the, the second Koyo show, the first one we were supposed to play with music, if I remember right, was a Rate of Salvation headliner. I booked at AMH that got canceled because of COVID. It would have been like right when we got back from that sanctioned typecast tour. And that yeah. that was like, Yo, we're gonna get to play a show with music out. That's crazy yeah. that this got that far. And that got the canned. first show we ever did, we played without, we just with nothing. Nobody. It was just people who knew who we were, and it still packed out that fucking yeah, yeah. It was, it was the best first show ever, you know, for sure. It, so it was the flyer says X typecast, X hangman. It's <laughs> like just goes on and on. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty crazy, for sure. And also, I mean, like. At the time, we weren't foreseeing COVID, and, and obviously it's been talked about to death and don't need to harp on it too much. But, you know, we everyone was on this. I mean, Harold literally is still working a career job that he's actively advancing in right now. But everyone was in a pre-work from home world. Everyone was on this tip of like TJ had an office job. Sal was going to tour full time with his old band. I was going to be a pro TM. Harold and TJ were going to be office guys. Like everyone had like. Everyone was on the same page of like, hey, like we are 23 and 24, career aspirations first. Like everyone's kind of reaching the end of their line with touring if they're, if respectively, if it, if pretty much excluding me and Sal. Like, let's just keep doing this in a way that makes sense for men in their approaching mid 20s. And uh, here we are a couple of years later. That's essentially opposite of what's going on. 
it, it it's really a, a, an inverted perspective at this point. Well, I think having that history helps. Like there's, I can't help but think of like thrice, like all those dudes have known each other so rock solid, but it can go the other way. Like you can fucking hate your friends that you grew up with. Like it's, yeah, that, that's probably helped. Well, we, we have a really lucky thing with that, you know, not, not everyone gets to uh, have a friend group that they can say they've gone back over 10 years with, you know, I, I think it's a pretty normal thing for people to graduate high school and kind of make new friends and move on to a different part of their life. But the, the reality is like our core friend group of people, um, some of which go back as far as like being friends since second grade. It's, it's just been ironclad forever. We, we can relate. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You, you know the vibe. No, we've we known each other, what, almost 30 years, Tuan? Yeah, I was going to say unfortunately, but it's very fortunate. <laughs> Dude, we, we always, like, joke about, you know, when we get home from tour, we're like, oh, man, I don't want to fucking see these guys right now, you know. But, but, <laughs> I love them, but we've been living on top of each other, and no bullshit, like, Joey will text the group chat, like, yo, we're home from tour, who's kicking it? And me and TJ will be like, we'll drive out to the Ireland and see you. Like, <laughs> yes. you know? like, like, we're just, I'll be like, yo, Joe, you want to come into Brooklyn? You want to hang out in the apartment today? Like, like TJ and I hang out. I don't know. I'm going to, I'm going to safely guess when we're not on tour, TJ and I hang out maybe three or four days a week, like minimum, you yeah. know, like, like we, we love each other. We always, we always hang out all the time. It's awesome. I feel it's very dope. great. No, it's, it's it's pretty amazing. It'll usually be like, all right, I'm home. Give me like two singular days of being a bum and decompressing, and then, yeah, fuck it, I'll go to the city. Let's hang. You know, like it's it, it's so uh, it, it's 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 not to be corny, but it's a beautiful thing because especially at this point in our lives, you know, like doing what we're doing at the capacity we're doing it, like so constantly. You know, for some people, I know it's actually can be a a lonely or alienating thing to friends and people back home and i'm not saying we haven't experienced that in any capacity at all but we're lucky enough that usually it's get home and it's like who's free let's fucking hang out and usually we do and usually it's with one another so it's it's uh something i'm very grateful for honestly i mean as a fan this is a a breath of fresh air too because all fans i'm sure you guys can relate we all get sick of the drama of like fleetwood max motley Crue's of the world like they hate each other but they're on stage faking it it's like well dude that fucking sucks it degrades yeah, the music right. and it degrades the performance, you know? Dude, it's, especially with, like, where we're at with it, like, I'd rather just break up than hate all my best friends at this point. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Like, it, the, the, those friendships like ours take staggering priority over doing a, uh, an emo band at 26, you know? Like, <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's one thing that I think most, like, casual fans don't realize and i've heard other bands talk about this in podcasts and interviews that like when you're on tour it's roommates on steroids you can't get away for the most part so you better like your bandmates or else it's yeah. not gonna last yeah yeah it, it, it's a mandatory thing to function if and, and that's that's also what's tricky about it when you're dealing with like your friends is like if you can't operate peacefully it's one thing to get under each other's skin and whatnot and, and annoy each other every now and then but if you really can't hack it at least four months out of the year, you're going to be traveling consistently with a person. Like it's, 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 uh, what's the way to put it? But it's, it's not practical for anyone to operate that way and continue that way. Unfortunately, it, it's, it's difficult shit because we're lucky. We're lucky. It works out for the five of us, obviously. But I think that's the problem is you start bands, they take, you get out there and you start doing it. And then people realize what, you know, one by one, it's like, Oh, I love you in the context of my life where I'm not touring, where we're hanging out maybe five days a week because we're good friends, but I still go home and sleep in my bed alone. You know, I don't have to start and end my day with you. And I, I think that's where it gets tricky with people in bands. And I think that's where you get a lot of that, uh, all that you see in the world of people, bands breaking up, people leaving, you know, people hating each other, whatever, whatever. I, I think you can't plan to have to spend 24 hours. 30 days straight consistently with people. And I think it's oftentimes sheer luck if it works, you know? And I think we're lucky. We're very lucky. It, it was tested like the worst it's ever been when we were at the studio. And I, I, don't, I say tested like kind of in quotes because like TJ and I recently spoke about how daunting of a thought, like being in the studio. We were in the studio for, so I was in... I was on crutches, so I wasn't really walking when we were in the studio um, over the summer. 
So I couldn't really go anywhere. And this the five of us were living with each other for six to eight weeks or something like that. Like, yeah. but like we weren't seeing anyone else. Like we weren't doing other things. You know, it's not like when you're on tour, you can sort of, you know, I can't tell you how many times a, a friend of mine's band is on tour and I hit them up to hang out and they're like, please God, I want to get the fuck away from these people. You know, it's like, and they want to just like hang yeah. out one-on-one -on -one with me or whoever. And like, they're so tired of being around the same people. And like when we were at the studio, it was, you didn't have that option. You know, we were, we were on a farm, yeah. like went, uh, hours away from our friends and family. And like, we were all on top of each other all the time, sharing one bathroom, like, staying up every night watching stuff on tv and then yeah. waking up and going to get coffee together like there was no independence at that point it really it felt like and uh i thought it went great it made the process better nobody like got i don't i don't think anybody got to the point where they were like i'm so fucking over this i have to go home you no, know def definitely not it's one of those things where like via that experience like i don't ever want to make a, a record another way than hunkering down and just doing it in a place you know I don't want a disjointed effort. I kind of, I kind of like the forced situation of yo, like you're living with the the four other people that you are making a piece of music with for at least a month, you know, deal and make make something special for that reason, you know. Yeah, I I, I think it's actually uh, you know, I I think it's conducive to uh creativity, like and actually like rapping records you know we we went in there like with about half a record done and then like 30 song ideas and we did like a week of pre-pro where we just stood around in a room and went over everyone's song ideas and fleshed them out you know as much as as much as you can in a, a live room setting with with uh john markson who produced the record and uh that as a process was so relieving and so felt so natural and cool compared to just sitting there and grinding your teeth on demoing stuff at home or just fucking recording yourself playing guitar. It was like, oh, this is how songs are supposed to be written. Mm. Like, it's one thing to bring an idea to the table, but to flesh songs out together, to be able to fucking tackle everyone's minutiae ideas, throw things out, try new things, and have a third-party perspective being John, who basically played, like, sixth band member for the whole process. Like, that's how you make a record. And paired with that is you get done with a long day of, playing songs for eight hours you go downstairs and everyone just hangs out more yeah. you know we were talking earlier uh the band started as this no pressure will not do stuff versus do stuff then you get into this situation where you hu you hunker down you make you want to get the songs together and done did pressure creep in with that or is, did it just feel natural the whole time i think a little bit like there was more I would say I would say there was anxiety leading up to it, you know, like I had asked every friend of mine that I could think of who did a record recently. And I would hit them up and I'd be like, yo, so what was it like to do a full length? You know, like, what's it like? How many songs did you have? And everything they said would make me feel insecure about our process, you know, like and once we got to the studio, it really challenged, you know, our process. And I think it showed us that it's our own and it works and it's unique and like there was from then on it was smooth sailing like we had it, it so it was an intimidating environment for sure just to be in a space where and not because of john or the studio or anything like we'd worked with him before it's just intimidating to think like i'm here to get this done you know like we're here we're gonna live here for six weeks eight weeks whatever it was and we're going we have to complete this task like that was a hard thing to think about. And then once it got moving, it was, it felt perfect. It felt natural. You know, it felt like that was where we were supposed to be. It didn't feel like this is where I have to be. It feels like, oh, well, this is where we're supposed to be right now. This feels great. Yeah. Cause I mean, now there's an expectation. I mean, the first two EPs blew up. You know, the second one came out on Triple B. I mean, that was when I first heard you guys. And to be honest with you, I was intrigued by the name. I was like, I have no idea what to expect. <laughs> I have no idea. Yeah. And I was obsessed. And so you guys popped off from that. And like, that seems to be, so two EPs in a row. I mean, that's kind of standard in the scene, but it sounds, seems like that's kind of where it's going versus full LP. But this, your upcoming release is a full LP? Yes. Yeah. 
it, it, it felt like due time because we did uh three singles that followed drives as well, which kind of like are collected as a essentially another EP. And it's like, you know, we have 12 songs, I think, out and available to the public. And in my head, that's all that's all good and well in this world. It's, it's, it's an EP and singles uh, environment in the broader music world, I suppose. But like a band like ours, like whether it's for the for, for fans, quote unquote, or not, like, you know, we owe people a LP. That is just like what a band like ours does. If you're a band that's influenced by the bands that we are influenced by, you look to those bands and go, damn, look at their XLP run. For some, it's right. one. For some, it's four. But like, those are all LPs, you know, usually front to back. And that's kind of like what we want to be to a modern generation. And whether people will take to that or not, I suppose that's to be seen because, you know, it's, it's, it's like you guys said, it's EP world. Like, it, it, you know, people, people have short attention spans. They like quickly consuming music. They like banging through a couple songs. And that's great. I do too. But I, our hope and my, personal feeling of what we accomplished with this record is, you know, I, I think we put something together that feels like one of those LPs that's like, yo, you start it, you finish it, and then if you got nothing else going on, you start it again. Hell yeah. I, lo- I love that. That's, that's exciting to us. Because, I mean, we, we're a little older. We, we grew up in the world where you'd get the get a couple singles. It was like a six-week lead-up to get a full record, mm-hmm. and then we, you'd dig into the full record, and you know, it's certainly changed because people's attention spans have, have changed over time but we're we're here for for both sides of it but we're here for a full length from you guys so that's exciting stuff for yeah, sure you're, you're gonna break your two ep run yeah how did how did uh triple b take notice curious about that uh that i believe if i remember right was uh was a pass off from uh from my friend scanlon i i i I think it was something to the effect of like Sam was just kind of aware of the band because I'd known Sam before uh, we did Koyo. Just, you know, I, I funny enough, I met him in Orlando where he's from, but obviously like doing typecast, like touring with Vane, I, I had a lot of time spent in the Massachusetts area and like in there and like the greater Boston slash Valley scene and uh, just kind of met Sam and stayed in touch with him. So he knew who I was and I knew who he was and we were friends and whatnot. But I think Scanlon was the one who was like, hey, Sam wants to put out a record for you if you're down. Um, and that was pretty much just a, as, as simple as just talking to him the next time I saw him. I was like, you want to do it? And he was like, yeah, let's do it. You know, it, a very easy and natural thing. And that, that blew up. I mean, that, that's really what put you guys on the map for the most part. I mean, the first DP, I'm pretty dialed. I hadn't heard of you guys up to that point. So, but it was, I mean, you're one of my favorite bands. And like, I... It's funny. This morning, I was playing Drives Out ECP, and I go to my wife. I go, guess who this is? She goes, story so far. Because that's the only band she likes in my world. Mm-hmm. And I go, I go, look on our uh, fridge. We have a calendar on our fridge where I make sure I write everything so you know, she knows what's going on. Mm-hmm. And I'm seeing Anthrax in two weeks. And she goes, is this Anthrax? And I go, it is <laughs> not <laughs> Anthrax. Oh, she goes, she goes, an honest try. <laughs> yeah, she, she said Koyo, but pronounced it wrong. And I'm like, yeah, it's, Ooh, it's, it's them. Yeah. That's awesome. I wish we were Anthrax. That'd be so <laughs> yeah. cool. That would be pretty dope. I, I think the, guitar, the current guitar player of Sworn Enemy is like their guitar tech. And like, oh, really? Road dogs, so that's pretty crazy. Hardcore. That's yeah, bad. Really. Yeah. So do you guys, do you guys feel the hype right now? Like, I was trying to explain to you guys my wife, and I was like, do you remember that magazine, Alt Press? I was like, I think they, if that was still around, like, their ceiling's like the cover of Alt Press, and she, it meant nothing to her. But, like, in my head, I'm like, I think that's where this could go. They, they did a full-page shred for us. Like, oh, did they? Oh, yeah, wow. in, in June, we, we, got, yeah. we got a full two pages in Alt Press. Shout out. Within the first ten pages of, of the magazine, which... Age twelve, that's one of those like inconceivable prospects. That's yeah, great. No, I, was well, just, I just fumbled yeah. that then. Jesus. Like, no, 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 don't fumble that. It. It's it's dope you brought it up because that's still a crazy one to me. I, I have the copy sitting around somewhere over there, but it's you know it, how crazy it was to tell like my my mom and my sister, like my mom who used to get my alt press copy and out of the mailbox, and my sister who also had a subscription to it to just send you know show them a picture of the copy one day and be like yo this is all pressed did an article about us it was crazy it's hilarious you know 
Yeah. That was, that was a, a Dubin connect. To mm-hmm. Oh, Alex. nice. Yeah, they did a spread on him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Same, same issue. Yeah, same, same issue. Same issue. Same yeah. Issue. So your parents were like, so he's not just dicking around with Joey all day. Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, they, my, my mom definitely still thinks I'm just dicking around with Joey all yeah, day. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, she'll, <laughs> she'll like, she'll say stuff like, you know, I'll, I'll send her a picture of, um, I'll, I'll send her a picture of us playing in front of like a big crowd or something. And she'll be like, wow, I didn't know that many people would want to listen to that type of music or something <laughs> like that. I'm like, all right, thanks. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I've heard that before from from my wife as well. <laughs> like, oh wow, people are into this it, stuff. It, oh yeah, yeah they are. So you're on the chorus slightly FM? backhanded. Wow. Okay. Slightly backhanded. Yeah, it's cool to have those like like all press being one of them. It's cool to have those metrics of like, of uh, you know, I don't want to call them like popularity or success, but it's cool to have those things that like you know your 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 family and your friends know about so where it's like they're they're not in the it's it's cool to have them just to be like oh yeah you might know what this is like it's pretty cool huh you know it's like like anytime i love seeing any hardcore band and look like i i get it it's not supposed to be a commercially accessible and viable thing and like a popular thing but i love when like you know i think incendiary posted like picture like a a a charting picture where they had like you know billboard vinyl listings and stuff like that or whatever it was you know anxious same deal where they hit like different charts like i think that's so cool because now you get to go to your you know to people who like aren't really involved in this world and just be like yo so that was this is something that i i did you know that's got to be a cool feeling it's it's it was the same feeling i think with all press where we were like yo that's pretty cool you know yeah yeah for sure this magazine i mean if you pretend you're not excited about that you're full of shit (laughs) Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. It's you so know. cool. It's awesome. I mean, especially having the subscription, that's that holds more weight than being in Rolling Stone. It's like, no, dude, this is the real thing. This is what I used to read, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a publication that I actively read, you know? Oh, yeah. yeah. Nate, it's like if you were in Kerrang. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's your holy grail. Yeah, it's in the country UK. Fuck. I would also be psyched to be in Kerrang. <laughs> <That'd> be <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> it's, it's, it's just one of those things. It's like, those, those like, uh, they're some of the few publications that, you know, your parents might know or your or your cousin who's a little older than you might know. And you'd be like, look, there's a grounding thing that that will, you know, contextualize what I'm doing to you for all the for all the normies out there. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I think my uh, I think my parents are going to uh, our Bayside tour in New Jersey with my cousins. Um, it's like right by my like cousin's house. We moved from Long Island to Jersey. And uh, it's like insane to, I mean, obviously it's a support tour, we're just opening and whatnot, and not to, you know, downsize the whole thing, but it's like, it is crazy that they're going to come and it's like, all right, well, we're playing a 1500 cap room for, it's the send off to this month long tour of Bayside and Avalanche. And, you know, it, it's just a crazy way for them to see the band for the first time. It's, it's almost like an expectation versus reality thing. It's like, yeah, that, that's not seen what we usually no. do. Right, yeah. You don't, like, you're not showing up with 10 other people at this tiny little hole-in-the-wall venue to check you out for the first time. They're going to see you in front of, you know, 1,500 people. That's, that's yeah, wild. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's definitely crazy. Yeah, it's on a ticket master ticket. It's not like a raffle ticket. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. It, it's it's not just get this, one. this teenager twenty bucks at the door. You know, that and... was I was that teenager. Yeah, I, I remember that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they weren't tickets that some promoter made you sell thirty of them. You know, just to play the show. This is it, the real deal. Plenty of that too. When we were yeah. like, oh yeah, 14. Oh, pay to play. A lot of oh that. yeah, funny, funny, funny. Whole, whole lot of uh. So we sold uh twenty five. The guy said thirty five. Ma, can I have a hundred bucks, uh, please? Yeah. Support, <laughs> so support us. I, I don't think he'll let us play again if we don't if we don't pay the uh, the difference. She's like, that's a, that's a good thing, Joey. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's so it's so crazy how uh how like once you actually get any type of like involved in any whatever's actively happening in your local scene, you very very quickly realize that those are all just scumbag pieces of shit. Who don't? Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're, <laughs> they're like multiple layers removed from whatever is actually going on. Like anyone who does the pay to play thing is like, it, it's like a Ponzi scheme. It's just not a part of reality. It's not an actual part of anything relevant going on in underground music. It's just some random douchebag trying it's to make some, money off teenagers. It's some asshole who's like, who's like, I could exploit a teenager for $40. Yeah, right, exactly. yeah, yeah. <laughs> when, when, all, when all of his expenses are covered, he's like, I got a sweet $200 coming yeah. in tonight. 
It's like, exactly. dude, you, you probably would have had a sweet 200 bucks if you didn't exploit the teenagers, too. Like, and only at the matter. expense of exploiting a child, let's go. You yeah. know, what an asshole. <laughs> real, real, real scumbag shit. Yeah, and they're out there. They're definitely out there. That, oh, that, yeah. That's the thing. Like, I'd like to say, like, oh, like, that's not really a thing anymore. It's certainly a thing. It's just not at all remotely close to my life. But I, I feel bad for any, any teenage kids that are just, you know, getting. They just getting... want to play shows. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because it's definitely still around. There's definitely people that, you know, want you to buy on for this local showcase or whatever. It's like, you know, that, that's not only like a, a exploitation of them, but it also sucks because your band's not going to get anything from it. It's not going to grow your whatever you're doing. Like every, everyone there is just they're, they're all cherry picked little individual like bands that sound nothing like each other. Usually it's they're organic. all just paying yeah. on. Yeah, yeah. It's not organic. It's. And no one sticks around for each other's bands, too. That's, like, the other thing I remember from those shows is, like, <laughs> it'd be eight bands on the bill. Everyone paid this guy 30 bucks worth of $12 tickets just to play, and your band would play. And whoever your friends are that would come would come see you. Then everybody leaves. Everyone's watch repeat eight times. You know, it was, it was just crazy. So going to pivot here a little bit. So you guys came back from the U.K. fairly recently, and I heard, Joey, you said you were in Europe with Vane. Was this... Was this your first time as a band in Europe? Yes. Nice. How was that? Because I know Comeback Kid, cult following over there. I know that. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure the other bands too, but they're known. You know, it's kind of like the Boy Sets Fire, like that world where they pop off for those for those guys. But for sure, it, it's it's a different meta in uh in Europe. It's it's so interesting how uh some bands you know have their just a bigger career there than here. You know and I don't think any bands that have that would, would tell you any otherwise either. It's not like a disparaging thing. It's just factually speaking, some bands are bigger in Europe from years of them doing it over there and it taking there than it is here because for whatever reason, European act like European audiences, like when they take to a band, they're lifers. So they'll, they'll just go see them forever. Every time you're over there, they will not. It, it could be their, their kid's birthday and they're not not going to the show. But it it was pretty crazy, you know, to see that. I'd always heard of the the fabled European comeback kid audience, and they were definitely present. You know, we played a lot of Germany shows, and a lot of you know, like it felt like it felt like comeback kid had like a legitimate drawing presence of of had some weight, you know, on Silverstein's tour because Silverstein also draws very well out there too. Like those those shows were like full rooms of Silverstein fans who would come out early, which was also awesome because we were under the that expectation awesome. that we'd play to nobody. Um, and we played to a full room almost every single night without fail, with the exclusion of like maybe like the Czech Republican example, and the room was full by like song two. Every single time we were like, oh, all right, it, this looks like the one. This looks like the show where there's going to be nobody. There was never nobody. By song two or three, the room was full, completely full, every single time. I mean, it's a great place to make an impact to Europe, because if you make an impact there you're going to be going back on rotation, right? Festivals, tours. We've had bands on here that, like you just said, like they kill, they slay in Europe and Japan. Sometimes they're in like five-star hotels. And in the States, it's, you know, the local crowds, but it's just mm -hmm. a different, you know, they take to it differently. They buy all the merch. I was just in Japan. There's still like the old school record stores for like, yeah. you know, tw $20 CDs. So like the, the market's completely different. It's the only place in the world where CDs still matter. Japan is where it's at for that, you know, like they have streaming and whatnot in whatever capacity, like, but people still, that is their preferred method of consuming music. They go to a, a Tower Records and they buy a CD off an end cap there. It's pretty crazy. Yep. And vinyl. I, when I was there, I, I didn't realize, but there's more record stores in, in Japan or Tokyo specifically than any other place in the world. I don't know if yeah. that's 100% accurate, but that's what I read. Dude, it, it's, it's actually also it's a crazy. gold mine at that from an, a, a, uh, american standard because mm -hmm. a lot of uh particularly with hardcore a lot of like japanese fans and whatnot like you know in the 90s and 2000s would you know buy whether it be bands coming over there or buying from people in america would buy out people's records and whatnot and over there the the collector culture is pretty uh pr pretty like consistent like they'll, they'll buy something and they'll shrink wrap it or they'll take really good care of it but you'd find like you could wander into a record store there and be like, all right, plopping through whatever, whatever. Ah, here's a uh, mint condition, Madball set it off, first press, you know, rip it out, and it's like 20 bucks. 
it's it's crazy like so i think that some people nuts. do legitimately make their living going to japan a couple times a year buying out whatever like crazy finds they can get at record stores and flipping them here because that's why you... nate was gone for a month that Holy makes sense. Sense. yeah yeah, yeah. 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 Nate, Nate's finding a new BMW <laughs> off of uh, whatever he got in Japan. It all makes sense. Holy shit. <laughs> Dude, it, it's crazy. You legitimately, like, just find the most wild stuff, and it's all at prices that you could just, you, you could never find it here unless you went to, like, unless you were, like, buying records at, like, a, a, a thrift store or something where, like, they're not, like, paying any mind to the online market. Yeah, someone's garage sale, right? They yeah, yeah, don't know exactly. what they have. And that doesn't happen much anymore because everybody has the internet so they can yeah, all check yeah. and see. Every, everyone knows what everything's worth. And in Japan, for whatever reason, like you could just find find stuff that is maybe there. I don't know what the explanation is, but it's worth a lot more here than it is there, typically. So speaking of UK, aren't you guys, you guys are opening for Denzel Curry. For outbreak, right? Yeah, that's, that's, that's fucking so crazy. Broken. I'm talking about that. That's, that's nuts. Impressive. That that was a crazy pivot for that fest too, because we we were trying to play last year and it just didn't end up working out. And they were pretty much like, "Yo, we got you next year." Next year comes along, and there's there's now this big rap component in the fest that was not there in prior years that I personally am, am psyched on. I think it's cool. I I, I think it's a, a pretty crazy uh crazy thing to know that we're going over there and playing to that, you know. Well, he did those uh, Rage Against the Machine covers that were so good. Incredible. So he's he's yeah. in tune with no, all music, on. right? I mean, he sure. also did uh, Bad Brains. No, like, he did. Yeah, I missed that one. Yeah, uh, I'm I'm like pretty sure he did a Bad Brains cover too, and he killed it. He's he's great. Earl Sweatshirt's also playing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> So tell your parents that. They'll be like, oh, okay, now I get it. Yeah, nah, they don't care either way. <laughs> they don't give a shit. It's, it's all good. <laughs> it's all good. I, I, honestly, I, I think my mom at this point, just via, like, because she's very supportive and, like, is very uh, weirdly, like, uh, in touch with what's going on and, like, understands the context of certain things to our band. It's like, that's where I think I lose her. I, like, Denzel Curry, I think she'd be like, ah, oh, he's famous, right? But, like, I, I told my mom we were doing Europe with Silverstein. And she's like, that's so great for you guys. It makes so much sense, blah, 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 blah. Like, you know, she, she understands the context of, like, the the things that directly have to do with the band. You know, like, she she gets it, which is awesome. But I, th I think the rap stuff is where I lose her. I think she'd be like, Denzel Curry, famous guy. I've heard the name. You know, like, <laughs> that, that's about it. You gotta tell her later you were on the Patio Slate podcast. That'll that'll set it off. I'm sure yeah, she'll yeah. be like, "Oh yeah, she'll, those guys. That's awesome." She'll, she'll probably listen. She, oh, she, please, she, please she do. does. In, yeah. Insert the Snoop meme here. Who? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Silverstein. She's like, "Oh, I saw it in your AP subscription." <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> awesome. She, she, even even Bayside. You know, she was like, "Oh, like full, fully understood why that was crazy for us." Like. You know, same same deal. She just knows knows across the board. Even at like a current band level too, it's just like I can like rattle off contemporary names and whatever we're figuring out, getting up to going down the line. She just she just knows what's going on. It's it's pretty crazy. And like you said, you're going out with Bayside and Avalanche fairly soon. Yeah, we we live in like two and a half weeks, I think. Yeah, and you're playing a show tomorrow night. This is full disclosure about a week prior too. So you you're playing a show tomorrow night, right? We are, which I keep. It, it's crazy how that came up so fast. Yeah. Um, but we are, we are playing. Uh, we're playing AMH for the first time in about um, a year and a couple months. It, it's been a long time, which you know, usually that's not the case with with AMH is Amityville Music Hall. It's like one of the mainstay local venues on Long Island, and uh, you know, hardcore owned and whatnot. Like it's, it's, we got bought out by the right people in like 2014. It's basically just been stuck around ever since. But usually it's like a, oh, I played AMH like nine times this year, not uh, not like two times ever, mm -hmm. and it, it's a benefit show for our friend Zach, who unfortunately like the I think it was literally like Christmas Eve. Thankfully he wasn't home, but had a house fire, his house burnt down, everything gone. Um, it's basically just a benefit mm -hmm. show to uh support him and his family, and uh, he's all good, you know. As as these things go, you know. He's got insurance, like, he's got a friend to crash with, like, everything's gonna be okay, but there's due process with all this, you know? So it's like, if we could do anything to help offset his displacement a little bit, you know, in whatever context, you know, whatever we could do to just make this a an easier time, you know, we were like, of course totally. we will. So yeah. we, were, we were happy to play it. 
a long time great friend and an OG supporter of Koyo. For sure. You know, and everything else we've done, but particularly Koyo. You know, yeah, yeah. He 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 awesome. sang in uh sang in that band Jukai. He played bass and cipher for a long time. A couple other Long Island bands on the way too. But just, you know, guy that's been around for a long time. He he uh if teaches in New York City, if I'm correct, you know, just a guy who did the did the tour thing for a while, always on the band thing, always goes to shows and you know, just started on his career on top of that and it's unfortunate that that happened, but I think uh, Saturday will be a cool, relieving thing, you know? That's cool. Well, Hangman's playing, right? Yes, we are. That's cool. Double duty. Ooh, you, double you, you, ready, you ready for that, Harold? You ready? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's, I've done double duty before, and it's, um, it's fun. It's cool. My guitar doesn't really like it, because I got to tune up and down, and I'm not bringing a second guitar with me, because I don't have... I don't want to. I don't yeah. care. I, but it's um, yeah, it's it's always fun. I I don't really nowadays. I don't really move around too much because of um, I have a a funny limp and a bad leg from a, an injury I got on tour last year. So I don't jump. I don't really get tired after we play, which feels great. It feels great. awesome. So nice. I'm gonna be fine. Nice. I'm gonna be awesome. Funny enough, I think the last time Coyle played AMH was also double duty with Hangman. Yeah. We I did we did it with the Prime and Stereo at, at Elsewhere also. Oh, that's right. We did do that. I forgot about that. Yeah. That was awesome. And I had to move my amp to the other side because Michael wanted to stand by himself yes. when Hank can play. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And I was like, that. dude, do I really have to? And he was like, Well, could you? And I was like, <laughs> Okay. My, Michael from Hangman is the singer of Pain of Truth. So we're all, all right every man on Long Island is, you know, it, it, all, it's all threaded together. So many connections, right? right. Yeah, yeah. yeah we're, we're, there's, a, there's like 10 of us who make up every band, you know. <laughs> so yes. if we hang on this long enough, we'll see more band members in the background at Harold's apartment. Uh, yeah, honestly. Soon. Yeah, that, straight up. It, it's funny you'd say that because that's probably that could happen very realistically. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. So you have that that show coming up. And then after that, any shows on the run that you have like highlighted that you're looking forward to to check out, just whether it's the venue or the city or anything like that? I'm excited to play House of Blues Vegas. How, uh, nice. Truthfully, like with with no diss, uh, just being candid, House of Blues can be a headache sometimes because they're just very, very legit. Like the load in, getting checked in, it's just always a process and that's annoying, but they're cool venues to play. You know, like that's like, I'll deal with uh, I'll deal with having to get formally checked in by security and make sure that everyone's names who were submitted by the head TM two months in advance are on the list. And if God forbid someone's not, you know, it's a whole thing. Like I'll deal with little annoying things like that if if it means playing rooms like that because it it is pretty cool. And we we played Vegas for the first time on our way back from the Stick to Your Guns tour, and we played at a, a VFW over there that's been popping off for a while. It's pretty cool. But that that's what I'm definitely looking forward to. It's right on the strip. It's it, it should be pretty crazy. I think a lot of it not a lot uh some of it's repeat. There's a couple of repeat spots from, from other tours or places I've been before. But uh White Eagle Hall too, uh, for the Jersey show and Union for Philly, those are both places I've been a couple of times, but I'm excited to play. You know, those are both like huge rooms where I was like, I will never play this for any reason. Maybe Union for this is hardcore. But that's like a cheat because this, this is hardcore. So you get to play a, a room of scale. You know, you, it's kind of like a hack. But I never thought that I'd be on a tour that was, uh, you know, put me in any of those rooms, period. That's cool that there's still places you haven't checked out. And at some point, you will have checked, you know, will have been everywhere. Like we had Scott Russo, the singer of Unwritten mm -hmm. Law. And he was saying, like, guys, at this stage in the game, we just go to places where we want a vacation. You know, yeah. <laughs> and th that's like, the, I feel like that's the life. That is the life. It's the way to do it. That's a good spot to be in, especially when you're like, when you've reached the point where you're like, okay, we do not need to tour full time anymore. Just doing the targeted vacation uh, fly out is kind of the dream. We're not there yet, but yeah. one day that will probably be our reality. R Russo's living in San Diego and going to Australia. Like those are the places that he mm -hmm. plays. So yeah, he could do that. <laughs> Smart. It's very smart. It's a good way to be. Yeah, that's why paying those, uh, playing those shows in Europe now are going to pay dividends later because you've got that crowd and they'll invite you back and you can kick back and summers go to Europe. 
No, 100%. That That's truly a game of uh, persistence. Like, you know, the, the reality is, like, Europe can be a uh, mixed experience for bands their first couple times through. Sometimes it's dope, sometimes it's not, you know, and everything in between. It, it, it's not a guaranteed, like, America, you could be a hot band, come out the gate and probably know, yo, the first time I play in certain place here is going to be crazy. Not at all the same over there. Which, in our situation is why i feel very lucky that we had the experience we did in the sense of uh playing to full rooms because i think the hard thing about europe is just playing to people you can be on a support tour if you're lucky enough to get one and people might not show up for your set you know like the the fandom there is so cult and obsessed like we went into that under the expectation that it's conceivable we will play to rooms that are like 10 percent full and if so that's just what it is but we, we were lucky enough to first time through play to a lot of people and you know, hopefully they come back when we go back because we're 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 running it back in June for about two weeks. We also thought that of the ten percent of those people, all of them would hate us. Yes, that was also an expectation <laughs> for yeah. sure. Yeah. Come on, guys, people love you. Come on, we got we got over pretty okay with 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 the Euro crowds. You know, like more than you figure. I say jump, they jump. I say wave your hands around, they wave your hands around. Like the things that you expect them to actively reject when you ask, like. I there were very few moments where I felt like ah oh, the crowd's turned against me or anything, but few few shows and few moments where I was like, all right, nobody here gives a fuck and they they just want me to get off stage, which which you know like again speaking candidly like that is some people's common experience their first couple times in Europe. Sometimes it it is just like that, and that that's not anyone's fault. That's just testament to like how cult and obsessed some of the fandoms are there, you know. Well, I think you get that here too. Like for US sure. US crowds that they'd be like, I gotta put my phone down for this. Come on. Yeah. Dude, I, I did a, a kill switch engage parkway drive after the burial tour with Vane, uh like May of 2019. And there were so many shows where Parkway Drive fans it was like a co headliner they'd switch. Parkway fans and even some kill switch fans, which I really thought would be the ones that would, would get it, Vane would play. You know, I, I sold a lot of CDs and stuff. There were definitely people that came back with the headliners and everything, but there were some shows that were, I wasn't even playing, and it was hard to get through the set because you could just tell their discontent with music that's so abrasive, especially with, like, the way Parkway sounds now. It's a very, like, it's it's a radio rock band, you know? Like, and I'm not saying that in a negative way. It's just, it's different from, like, their, like, metalcore beginnings and whatnot. So I don't think their newer fans really, uh, are interested in something that was as abrasive and intense as Vane. So, like, you'd, you'd get a couple songs in, and, like, you could tell that whoever, like, rushed to Barricade just to be at Barricade, which is even s still such a, a, a crazy practice, you know, at this point. But, you know, some people just get there and stay there the whole show, and those people were truly like, please stop. <laughs> like, oh, it, it was, wow. It, it, it was, yeah, some, some people are like that. And that's that's no testament to... Parkway, Vane, whoever, like, you know, this it's just how those things go sometimes. Cause you can't you know, like we, we said the term earlier, but like those are civilian fans. Those are just those are not people that are tapped into like underground music or subcultures. Those are people who probably hear, you know, uh Parkway on like liquid metal or something. Or if not something even more above ground than that. Like those are people that definitely I'm sure there's some lifers and long term fans, but those are not people who care to have their finger on the pulse, nor should they necessarily do such. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but those are not people who are like, I showed up early because I discovered this band Vane, and they're doing all this, this, and that at like a smaller scale, and I want to see it. Those are people who went, I love Parkway Drive, and if I don't get barricaded for Parkway Drive, I'm going to kill myself. <laughs> Jesus so it, Christ. It, 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 it's just, that's, that's the, the world of support touring. Sometimes they fuck with it, sometimes they don't. But it, it, it's it's uh it's no reason to stop doing it, you know. It's just there's a little bit of lottery to it. That's all. One of the shows that I'm excited for you guys. I'm actually going to it. I'm coming down from Maine is the Silent Majority show. Hell yeah, in Jeez, Brooklyn. I'm, I'm I'm stoked. I I was like I asked my wife. I was like, can I get 36 hours to myself in mm -hmm. uh, in April? And she's like, for what? And I'm like, it's not gonna mean anything to you, but it means a lot to me. Yeah. And I'm going down. So we're, I'm I'm. St so stoked for that. I never got the chance to see the reunions and I wasn't when I was 16 when they were active, I wasn't going down to mm -hmm. Long Island. Yeah, I mean they they were not they're a band that played out a fair amount, 
but they were not like a, a touring workhorse band. I think they did one full U.S. ever. I think it was the Indecision Millhouse one. Someone could correct me on that. It might be wrong. I know they've done other tours, but I think that was the only time they did a full sweep of everything. But I, I saw the 2016 reunions. Har- Harold Hangman played the second day of the uh, 2016 reunions. And, I think and that... the first day. Was the first day? Either way, like, re- regardless. Historical accuracy. Not that it fucking matters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. Right. <laughs> re- re- regardless, it was, like, insane weekend. Like, truly, like, one of the best days of my life. I don't think that's a crazy claim to make. You know, it was seeing a band I, I never thought I'd see. Plain and simple. That I, obviously any Long Island Harker kid loves dearly. So now to play with them, you know, especially in the context of like, oh, they're doing it bigger and better than the last time, you know, 800 cap room, like a room that really facilitates diving and going crazy. Like It's just an honor to be included. It's it's something we would have said yes to if it meant, you know, getting kicked off of every formal establishment we have on our side, you know. All right, we're going to wrap this up. We uh, We typically end with like lightning round questions, but there's only one. And I'm curious how you guys are going to answer this. Top five Long Island albums of all time. That's very difficult. Are we talking just, like, just off just off the dome? Let's let's go here. Our world, or are we talking? You like... can go Billy Joel. You can go Public Enemy. <laughs> I mean, you can do whatever you want. It has my respect, for sure. You know what, like. <sighs> That is an incredibly difficult question because <laughs> I knew it. Yeah. Yeah. I. All right. Let's let's I, soften it. Just toss a couple big ones for you. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want to get who's the at goat. The who, who? What album's the goat? Live of the Spectators, the goat. Where you want to be is the goat. Yeah. Beauty <laughs> self titles the goat. Um, trying to think what else off the dome. If we're talking hardcore, honest God, scared to death, the goat. Scared, scared to death is the is the goat. Yeah. That's that's true. I mean. Or and are we just talking LPs? Like this is the this is such a hard question. Hey, I'll I'll throw something in the mix. I'm not willing to put my name on it, but the agent demo is one of the goat demos. Agent of Long demo Island. is fire. Agent so demo is good. absolutely fire. So good. A- agent agent was a band with a like micro, hyper local like crazy moment. You'd fig- you figure they were Billy Joel when they were playing. You know, <laughs> like it was crazy here, <laughs> but only crazy here. I feel. I'm trying to think what else off off the dome. That that was it was oh, oh, glass jaw's dope. I mean, like every glass jaw record is good. E- e- even even material control, like obviously, like all these years later, you know, it's, it's it sounds like basically just sounds like quicksand worship, and it's still amazing. Like it is goaded. Uh, I'm I'm a true believer. Glass jaw is like it transcends like let's talk hardcore. Like that's just an amazing Long Island band. Yeah. To me. One of our favorites, collectively. Yeah, it's actually two. Exactly it's dope. two on my list. Worship and Tribute is two. I yeah. like that more than uh, everything. 52nd Street by Billy Joel. If we're going there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you got to go there. Yeah. Undeniable, really for sure. That, I'm, I'm throwing that there. Like, there, there's... God, like, I, I, my, my head hurts right now. Thinking oh, about also, <laughs> also want to take I'm a sorry. moment. I'm, I'm actually going to throw some public shade right now. Blue Oyster Cult reps Long Island. It's bullshit. Ooh. Ooh. Not Long Island. That's our headline right there. Oh, that, that's, 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 that's the episode. A bunch grabber. of people, a bunch of people who went to Stony Brook University, which is where we're from, but but they're they're all from wherever the fuck. Like they they rep Long Island. They rep even if you look at their Wikipedia, it says they all like are from Stony Brook. They're not from Stony Brook. They're from wherever the hell they're from. And mm-hmm. and Blue Oyster Cult got big. That's good for them. You know, I'm happy for them. Enjoy your millions and millions and millions <laughs> of dollars. But you're not a Long Island band. It's bullshit. As a as a Mainer, a lifelong Mainer myself, anybody that tries to say they're from Maine that moved here and isn't from Maine, I, I totally feel that. Yeah, Get if, out if of you town. moved here, it's not, not where you're from. Yeah. You could live 30, 40 years here, still not yeah. where you're from. Totally. Yeah. So, sorry, it isn't the way it works. Yeah, <laughs> I don't it's, make the rules. I don't make the yeah, rules. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's obvious stuff, you know? We were kind of throwing around some albums. So Worship and Tribute, mm-hmm. we're not going to go into brand new, but those records... Um, Silent Majority, Life of a Spectator, Troubled Stateside is my one. Dope record. 40 Hour Train. Oh, yeah. Thousand Mile Stare. Jeez, all the TBS records. You, you, you could go on. We yeah, go so, fucking so many. A lot, a lot of hot streaks from a lot of bands. Like, all right, I'm going really to give a couple, of, a couple of stragglers that I'm thinking of. Just <laughs> in the names that you said, I'm throwing new again up there. Yeah. Uh, sure. Underrated sure. TBS. 
underrated taking backs. I oh, don't know right. why yeah. it's not a part of their conversation often. You know, that record is unbelievable. Crusade. Incendiary. Yeah. Yeah, Crusade was and huge. Oh, so they, good. I I often forget the scope of like how large they've been with the newer stuff. That like, like I saw them do the uh, the ten year of cost of living the other night, and they they didn't play a single Crusade song, you know, and I, and like wow. the whole the whole crowd like knew every new song and like all that you know it was insane. It was like they played to a sea of people and not a single crusade song and i was like man that record really i mean i know this is to celebrate cost of living but after they played the record they did a whole bunch of other songs and nothing off crusade i think crusade is an incredible lp yeah yeah so antichrist is on that right yes that's yeah, yeah. that's the best song on the album oh yeah the only time we saw him play it was the, uh, or like the last time rather because we saw him play it a couple times before that but Record release show was the last time they played it. Yeah, jo- Joey living. and Joey and I went to the Cost of Living record release show when we were like fifteen or sixteen. His mom drove us, mm-hmm. and we we bought record release LPs and hid them in a vacuum closet in the basement of SRC or like a bottom floor. It was like a split <laughs> level venue. We we hid them in the vacuum closet and threw like our hoodies over it, and nobody stole them. And now that record sells for like one hundred and eighty dollars. Yeah, yeah. Know, that's hilarious to think about. But that's wild. That, I have very fond memories from that like whole period, but that time in particular. Yeah, that was the last time we saw them play Antichrist. Uh, also, in. just one thing to note because I was genuinely curious. Like, you know, yeah, we we sit here and we rattle off all these like Long Island records that are, are obviously like, even if they're not actively hardcore now, you know, maybe that's the scene they initially came out of. It's tangential to whatever, whatever. But there's like almost like this like self conscious thought of like, am I just like forgetting about huge acts like billy joel looking at a list of googles like i type bands long island we're not missing much man stray cats are apparently long island you know vanilla fudge whatever whatever but most of the bands on this list are does it does that include mentioned. like rappers though yeah i mean yeah, Mariah, yeah it includes public enemy or mariah carey is long island yeah, like, yeah. It, it includes a lot of big names but like the most of this list like is comprised with like all the bands we're talking about all the the, like most of what we've said so far is a majority of what this initial Google shirt search has like spat back at me, you know. That's and then yeah, even stuff like suffocations listed on here, crumb yeah, suckers, like there there are twisted sister, deep lore, hell yeah, it, you know, Ladderman, straight from the path. It's, it's all stuff that isn't Weedus. That's that's another big one. But oh yeah, it's it's all Love stuff Weedis. that isn't. We're not missing like stratospheric names here. All these bands have made impact enough for like our specifically local place that it's on par with uh you look at the list of Long Island bands and you got you got on the might of princes and garden variety, but there's like plenty of like that like there's plenty of things missing, I think. Like that might be I don't know. This is a pretty funny list. I'm looking at it now too. Yeah, th- yeah. this is just what Google says when you search uh, Long Love Island. Bands. Enemies. Love you know what the, you know what this yeah, means? It's crazy. We need you back on for Long Island Part Two. Uh, Garone did the first one. We'll have you back for another one. I'm That's down. Awesome. And we can deep dive the This Is Hell catalog or something. Who knows? Yep. Hell yeah. That was uh, Johnny Moore from This Is Hell. It was me and Harold uh, Spanish Spanish Substitute in eighth grade. <laughs> nice. Save yeah. it for episode two. Yeah, save yeah. it. So there's, <laughs> we, we, there's we your can hook. dice it all up. There's, there's a lot of deep lore. That's to the teaser. Through. That's yeah. the teaser. There's the hook right there. Well, shit, we're excited for what's in store from you guys here in 2023. We really appreciate chatting with you today. And uh, and maybe, you know, we'll see you down the line in the not-too-distant future. Of course. Oh, yeah. Appreciate I'll, you guys, I'll let you real. guys down at the uh, Monarch Show, Brooklyn Monarch Show. For yeah, sure. sure. That'd be great. 100%. We'll, we'll be probably by the table and whatnot. Just come say what's good. Thanks, guys. Cool. Thanks, Thank guys. you, guys. Thank appreciate you so much it. for having us. Thank you for listening to Patio Slave. We are at Patio Slave on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, all of the places that you can find us on social media. Facebook, Patio Slave Podcast. YouTube, Patio Slave Podcast there. Email us at Podcast at gmail.com. And hey, if you want to become a supporter, click on the link at the bottom of the episode and give us a dollar, give us five bucks. It keeps the lights on, keeps us going. We really appreciate that stuff. Thank you.